I can plant some seeds here. Who knows? <laughs> Let me pray first. Lord, I just thank you for this message. I pray, Lord, that you would guide the words of my mouth and control what comes out, and that those words would be your words, that they would seek the ears that you want them to seek and be heard by. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Rodney said he asked me to, pray, uh, to, to preach about the seven mountains of influence, and... Uh, I want to start doing that in a way that builds on something that he talked about a few weeks ago. What he did, is, he, as he put it, he cherry-picked a few uh, uh, passages in John where Jesus says, Now I call you friends instead of servants because I've told you all about my Father's business. And, and if you believe in me, you'll do even greater things than I because I'll do whatever you ask in my name because I'm going to the Father. And also about how he's now in us and he's given us a great calling on on our lives and we actually need slide one because we're going to talk about how you influence the seven mountains of influence. I cite those things that I just mentioned uh, because in fact you are, all of you right now, living lives of significance and lives of influence whether you believe it or not, whether you feel like it or not and whether you feel like you're having little or no effect on the world around you and on history but on the contrary you are and you need to know that now. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared for us in advance to do. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And then Rodney finished with Habakkuk 2.1, where Habakkuk goes up on the wall and positions himself to hear God's answer to his life's question. And his life's question was basically, okay, what's your plan for me to do great things, God? You remember that? It really blessed me. And the reason is because God will show you his plan for you. He'll show you your destiny, if you will. And, but, but you need to position yourself to hear it like Habakkuk did. So I'm going to put some legs on that today, if I can, and show you what it might look like. Let's get back to those seven mountains. Does that term sound familiar to anybody, Seven Mountains? How many have not heard it? Okay, that's all right, good. Well, then the sermon's over, and I'll <laughs> see you at the Pancake House. Um, but just to, as a reminder, the Seven Mountains of Influence are the seven uh, areas of society that shape and mold how we think and, and what our attitudes are and what our values are. And, and here they are, a religion, or family, religion, education, business, government, media, arts and entertainment. And the story here is that in 1975, uh, Bill Bright, the founder of uh, Campus Crusade, and Lauren Cunningham, founder of YWAM, or Youth with a Mission, discovered when they got together one day that God had simultaneously given each of them the same dream. And the dream was... Basically, and you hear it quoted slightly different depending on who you read, but it's the culture is shaped by seven mind molders or mountains in society. And that's why these have come to be known, the seven mountains of influence. God's message was, to them, was in order to transform cities, regions, and nations, we need to capture the seven mountains that shape the culture. And by the way, religion doesn't just mean church. It's, 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 it covers all faith, so... Uh, but I think church is going to be turn into be a key to, to, to this thing. So God was telling Bright and Cunningham where the battlefield is. These are the high places. This is where the culture will be won or lost. And their assignment was to raise up future leaders who would be change agents to do something about this. Uh, and that's, of course, now 40 years later, that's us. Everybody in this room and everybody in the church at large, really. And the idea is if we can have a major impact in these areas of society, the world is going to change. This is the marketplace. We hear that word a lot. But in a way, this is today's promised land. And it's just like the Israelites at the Jordan River, you know, after 40 years in the wilderness, this promised land is already ours. We just have to take it. Now, it's easy to understand how the seven mountains can influence uh, the culture, isn't it? pretty easy. Take education, media, and arts and entertainment, for example. They're probably the examples that we most think about and most get angry about and frustrated about. You know, why can't they do this or that? Well, you say, uh, yeah, I get that, but why isn't, is science important? Why isn't science important? 
Well, of course, science is important. And if you find a cure for cancer, you're going to change people's lives. But you're probably not going to change the way people think uh, or what their values are. What about politics? Uh, okay, that's really a subset under government. So yes, that's a, uh, that's a mind molder. But what if a combination of influence in education, media, arts and entertainment and family, starting with religion, we could put a stop to abortion? Now like a cure for cancer, that in itself probably won't change the way people think. The difference is that unlike for cancer, we've got to change the way people think before it's going to happen. And um, it's, it's not really the same thing as controlling them, though. You have to change the way they think. In terms of controlling them, Carol reminded me of the story of the rambunctious little boy whose mother finally made him sit down. And he said, <clears throat> I, may, uh, I may be sitting on the outside, but I'm still standing on the inside. So it didn't work for him. She didn't change the way he was thinking. Now, notice in the abortion example, I didn't, mention, I didn't just mention the family mountain, and that's because, next slide, yes, more often than not, these mountains are intertwined. They're interactive in the way they influence the culture. They feed off each other. They multiply their individual effects. A good education, for example, including an accurate teaching of world and American history is going to produce a generation of journalists who tell the truth in media, a generation of filmmakers who make wholesome, uplifting entertainment, and a generation of honest politicians and business leaders. And it's also going to lead to a generation of even better teachers, and so on and so on. So you can see how all this works together and, uh, and rolls into something really good. Well, so what? You know... What are we supposed to do about all this? Most of us are not running for president of the United States. Though I'm not sure these days. Is anybody in here <laughs> running for president? And, you know, we're not the CEO of a big company. We're not the Pope. We're not CNN. We're not Rush Limbaugh. How on earth are we supposed to take the seven mountains? It sounds very lofty, <clears throat> pun intended. And nothing to do with us down here in the valley. But what I want to do is give you a bit of a more encouraging and practical perspective on it. And that starts by recognizing that all of us have authority and power where we are. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Sounds pretty authoritative to me. And don't you think there's some power involved when you tell a mountain to throw itself into the sea? So here's another declaration. Whether we feel like it or not, in the name of Jesus, we are people of authority and power. The question is, what do you do with your authority and power? You're probably doing more with it than you realize. So up here now is a favorite Bible passage, which we probably can't read, but I'll read it to you, so don't worry. At the end of Proverbs, this is where King Lemuel's mother is advising her son on how to choose a wife. And I'm going to point out a few things as I go through it. So this is Proverbs 31, 10 through 31, the wife of noble character. A wife of noble character, who can find? She's worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her. Ah, she has a family and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She's like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it's still night. She provides food for her family, family again, and portions for her female servants. She considers a field and buys it out of her earnings and plants a vineyard. Now she's doing business, isn't she? She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees her trading is profitable. Again, trading, business, and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand, she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens the ar her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. So there's some charity there. 
She's, it's probably faith-based. So she's in a church or a synagogue in, in her time. So there's religion. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She's clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. So she has at least an indirect influence on government. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. More business. She's, she's clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. Education. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband and he prays also, and he praises her, family again. He, he, and as he praises her, he says, many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. <clears throat> Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done, and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. So then now she's an example for her society to follow and be encouraged by. Obviously a woman has just as much authority and power in her realm as we think of a man having in his. So what is she involved with? Uh, you can see them right there. Count them up. Family, business, religion, education, and government. Five of the critical areas of society. <clears throat> by the way, Today I'm using the NIV or the new international version, which I think is a good choice because I've actually been to some foreign countries, uh, like Canada and Texas, so it's, that's okay. Now, <clears throat> you know we tend to hold this woman up as some sort of a model of perfection, and that's not what it's about. It doesn't say anywhere that she's perfect. If it did, we could just ignore this passage because nobody's expected to be perfect. But she is a great example, and, and I think it's an aspirational one, especially for girls growing into womanhood, um, and, 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 and also women who don't tend to think of themselves this way and, and don't believe that God sees them this way, but he does. Now, watch this. Lemuel's mother says in verse 10, who can find a woman of such noble character? This, that, now that translation makes it seem like she's pretty rare, doesn't it? It always made me wonder, how come there weren't very many uh, worthwhile women in Israel? But, you know, here again, modern English and even the NIV are failing us, so maybe if we look at the Canadian or the Texas translation, or better yet, the original Hebrew, we'll even get a better picture. It's really about that word, find. It's matzah in Hebrew, and don't confuse that with matzah, the unleavened bread. It's a different word. Matzah in Hebrew, find, it actually means get, attract, gain, or attain, and not in an ownership sense at all, but rather like this. What kind of a man deserves such a woman? Or who's the man with character enough to win such a woman? In other words, character enough to match the character of the woman of noble character. Now remember this in particularly is a lesson for a king and of course in the New Testament sense we're all kings if we have the authority of Jesus in us, which we do. So it's, this is really much more than a primer on how to be a good woman, although it does serve as that too. But men, so you know, listen up, because this is a picture for all of us about how to shoulder responsibility and demonstrate character for everybody. In fact, if you go back to the first ten verses, of Proverbs 31. It's where Lemuel's mother is giving him instruction on just that, how to be a man of good character. And she tells him things like, don't be a drunkard, don't waste your strength on loose women, obey the law, defend the rights of the oppressed and those who can't speak for themselves or are poor and needy. Things like that. In seven mountain terms then, I would suggest that the real question is, who has the character to win a mountain? Authority and power are one thing. Okay, two things, and, and we have those, but do we have character? I think character leads to authority and power. And in fact, the King James Version uses the word virtuous instead of noble character to describe the woman of Proverbs 31. And that word virtuous, or kail in Hebrew, actually means force. She's a force. And if you have good character, you're a force. Why is this important? 
If we have people of good character on the tops of the mountains, we have a good life. Having people of good character influencing what goes on in the seven mountains, that's our goal. And the more there are and the higher they are, the closer we get to what's called a tipping point. Malcolm Gladwell, you may have heard of him, he's a Canadian journalist and author. He wrote a book uh, some years ago called The Tipping Point. And he said it this way, the tipping point is that magical moment when an idea, trend, or social behavior crosses a threshold, tips, and spreads like wildfire. He observed that the tipping point is similar to an epidemic because it's contagious by nature. Now, based on Gladwell's work, Lance Wallnau observed that whoever occupies the high places will be able to tip the culture toward or away from God's purposes. Then I like how Lance uses the epidemic idea to show how tipping points can lead to revival. He says, both revivals and epidemics require three things. The carrier, and that's, uh, that's the one with the authority and power, and that's us. Contagiousness, which in this case is the force of favor. Favor that comes when you're in the will of God, and it just does. It's like magic, but it's not magic. It's, it's, it's God doing it. The environment, prevailing intercession. Uh, the church, which is, again, you and me it continually praying, and I think especially out of Second Corinthians, uh, Second Chronicles 7.14, which, of course, is the one that goes, when my people who are called by that, my name will humble themselves and pray and so forth. So if, and if an environment of intercession is required, then it seems to me that religion, or the church in the case of the religion we're interested in here, is really a key factor. Deborah of the Bible, some of you studied her not too long ago, certainly knew that. She sought God for all of her decisions. She interceded for the people she was responsible for in her position. And so you remember the story in Judges 4. By following the battle plan that God downloaded to Deborah, the Israelite army defeated their captors, the Canaanites. Now, Deborah was a wife, so she was on the family mountain, of course, possibly others, we don't really know. But the point to consider is that as a judge of Israel, she was at the top of the government and religion mountains, and therefore in a position to, to affect the society in a very profound way. Deborah had what we sometimes call the Hebrew mindset, and we need to have that Hebrew mindset. I, I, actually, I think we do, but let's review that one more time. We need to understand, as the Israelites did, that God is at the center of everything. He was central to their culture. There's no wall separating him from anything in our lives, unless we put him up. Uh, Dr. C. Peter Wagner sums it up, I think, really well. Hebrews see both the spiritual and the national, natural, including work realms, as one entity under the hand of God. The conclusion that can be derived from the Hebrew perspective is that our work is a form of ministry. There's no separation. When you're out there in the marketplace, you are being church. So <clears throat> Deborah precipitated a tipping point. Her behavior caught on like wildfire. The people rejoiced and started earnestly following God again. And the land had peace for 40 years. And then she sang a very long song, so I guess that put her in the arts and entertainment mountain too. <laughs> now, like Deborah and the woman of Proverbs 31, if we shoulder responsibility and demonstrate character, then that Hebrew word matzah will apply to us as in who is the person with character enough to attain a mountain. So where do we fit into all this? Even more encouragement, I hope. This room today is full of both men and women of good character. And maybe we're not so far down in the valley as the world would like us to think about ourselves. All right, let's look at Deborah, our modern Deborah. Much like all of you here, those of you who are women, I mean. I'll call her Deborah because I think it's fun and because it's a good reference to somebody we know named Deborah who really was a strong person. Now, obviously, she's active, uh, but she doesn't just live in a vacuum at the fitness center, right? She has influence in a lot of places, starting with her family. Uh, and that's probably the most important sphere of influence for this Deborah. Supporting her husband in whatever he's doing, plus raising the future leaders of her city, state, or even the nation, or maybe some other nation. Then there's her church. So she's got influence on the religion mountain, uh, the religious affairs of her town. 
Maybe she's an elder or a deacon or serves in the nursery or is an usher or, or doesn't have to do any of those things. Maybe she just attends regularly. But because of that, that church body is different because she's there from what it would be if she were not. Of course, uh, she's involved with education, uh, that of her children and of others. Maybe she's on the PTA or volunteers occasionally at various events. Maybe she keeps an eye on curriculum and discipline, makes helpful suggestions about both. And here's a bit of a twist. Uh, uh, let's say her husband uh, uh, is on the city council and, she, and he also has a job. So all of a sudden, Deborah has again at least an indirect influence on government and business in her city. Now, Deborah herself could be on the city council, but she's chosen a different path. Uh, she's working part-time for the local TV station as a writer. So now she has influence in the media uh, mountain. Of course, that's a business too. And speaking of business again, she manages some rental property that she and her husband own as an investment. So she has a business, doesn't she? And finally, being a writer, she writes short stories and poetry. She hopes to get her great American novel published soon. And meanwhile, she belongs to a monthly book club. So that's her contribution to the arts and entertainment mountain. Let's put it all together. All right, I guess it is all together there. So, all of a sudden, our local Deborah compares very well with the woman of noble character in uh, Proverbs 31. She's even added media and arts and entertainment to the list. So she's got all seven. And there they are. Now, obviously, I could have chosen to depict a man in, the, in all these roles instead of a woman. Um, but I hope you can see yourself in it, whether you're a man or a woman. Can you see yourself in this picture? Maybe more than you could a few minutes ago? Because we don't think about it this way, and we need to. Now, there's no doubt that you are involved in several of these spheres of influence. Um, so what that means is, because you're already involved in some of these mountains, you are in a position already to change the culture, to change the world, starting with these, your own spheres of influence. So what about our local Deborah? Can you begin to see how important her participation in the seven mountains can be? Even if she's not yet on top in her city or state or, uh, or certainly not the nation, she's not yet subject to creating a national tipping point. She may be at the top in some of her local areas of, of influence so she can affect tipping points there. Does, this, does that make sense? Now just imagine what the seven mountains would look like if there were a hundred million Debras and Mr. Debras scattered among them at all levels all aware of their authority and power, intentionally working their way up toward the tipping points. And that's a vision I, I, I hope everybody gets. Now, do you like what's going on in the Seven Mountains right now? You do? No. The right answer is no. <laughs> so let's move to the next slide, because there is good news. Um... You know, we know that today in our society, everything's turned upside down compared to what God's intentions were for it. And I just stand in absolute awe of the millions of people who don't get it, who don't see it. But the Bible said this would happen. But also, Philippians 4.8 says, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So instead of looking at what God's not doing, let's look at some examples of what he is doing in the seven mountains. And by the way, much of what I'm going to say here comes from the Charisma Magazine website, so I didn't just make it up. In family, there's been a steady decline in the number of abortion clinics and the number of abortions performed in America. Given the number of young people who are pro-life, we may reach a cultural tipping point on this in the next generation. That was shocking to me. Yeah. The divorce rate, what do you think the divorce rate is? Everybody says it's 50%. It's, it, yeah, it's, yeah, about that, yeah. Okay, again, see at the pancake house. You get a point. It's, it's actually around 31%, but among people who regularly attend church, it's only 15 to 20, so split the difference and you're exactly right. In religion... Christianity is exploding in China. 
Some estimates are, are that by uh, 2025, there'll be 160 million Christians in, in China, which would be more than there are here. And, uh, and the government there has to, has to respect them. It, that's already happening because of their vast numbers. In education, the homeschool and school choice movements continue to grow. Uh, it's an estimated growth rate of 7 to 15 percent. That's a pretty wide range, so maybe they're not really sure, but this, this, probably the statistics aren't in. Homeschoolers score above average on SATs and ACTs. And colleges actively recruit them. The whole graduate school curriculum of Regent University, which now has 7,500 students on campus and by December will have 9,000, uh, and I don't know how many thousands have already graduated since the school was founded in 1977. But it's, all those disciplines in the graduate school are centered on the seven mountains. So they're doing something. In government, I'm not sure how this is going to play out, but we do see congressmen and senators opposing Planned Parenthood because of the uh, rev new revelations about some of their practices. There's prayer meetings in the halls of Congress. That's not actually not something new, but I have a, this, this just sense that they're taking on more uh, intensity and more importance. Bad actors in the IRS have been exposed for discriminating against Christian organizations who apply for a tax-exempt status. At least one outspoken Christian is running for president. That's not an endorsement, just a fact. And, and uh, Chick-fil-A, and, and now let's go to business. Chick-fil-A is closed on Sundays. Hobby Lobby refuses to pay for the morning after pill. Uh, ministries like the American Center for Law and Justice, and the Family Research Council, and others are, uh, are going to bat legally to support business who are businesses that are prosecuted for sticking up for their values. Like, uh, like Hobby Lobby, like uh, bakeries that refuse to cater gay weddings when there's a million other bakeries in the same town that, that, that people could go to. And they're winning in court. And that's government there. In media, uh, maybe you saw this story in early August. It was a, uh, about, it was a news story about a, a man dressed as a priest showing up at a traffic accident in Missouri and then disappearing after the victim was miraculously rescued. Anybody hear that? Was he a man or was he an angel? No. It, it, this merited a three-minute report, that, which is long, for ABC Nightly News and countless local stations. And, and what got me was that it was told with respect, with objectivity, and even a certain sense of awe by the people that were telling this story. So praise God for the producers that allowed that, that story to run. And there have been others I could name, don't have time. I just think we're seeing more and more of that. But pray that it's going to continue because it does change the atmosphere. It changes the way people think. The Greensboro News and Record has a column called The Good Stuff. It features good deeds committed by people in the community. I just think that's wonderful. When they first came out, I wrote to the editor and said, this is great, keep doing it. And he's kept, just because I wrote to him, he kept doing it. But, <laughs> but, no, and I don't take credit for that, but that's an example of something you can do. Yes. If you see something you like, yes. praise God and then praise whoever did it. In arts and entertainment, we have more movies promoting Judeo-Christian messages and values than ever before. Uh, we, recent examples, we could name The War Room, uh, Woodlawn, Films that some of us have seen, like Father of Lights, Furious Love, The Hand of God, testifying to signs and wonders. Um, University, again, wins Academy Awards for, for their student-produced films. How, how's all this happening? Well, of course, it's God's hand using uh, righteous people going in the marketplace with their Hebrew mindsets and, and the Holy Spirit empowering them, bathed in prayer, intercessory prayer, and they're changing the atmosphere. And I'll bet they aren't even all Christians because God poured out his spirit on all flesh. In, uh, and as Proverbs 21.1 says, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. So these are really people like you and me who think character and responsibility are important. They're con we're conscious of our authority and power. We're working hard. We're setting good examples. We're getting promoted. We're working our way up the mountains. And at each new level we get to, we're influencing more and more people, uh, and, and, and our spheres are ever expanding to, as we do that. So, again, see how the religion mountain is the key to affecting all the others? Uh, it starts with Jesus saying, basically, it's all mine and I give it to you. 
Again, Mark 11:23. If anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. And uh, God says to Cyrus in Isaiah 45, 2, I will go before you and will level the mountains. Are we talking about different kind of mountains here? I don't think so. Uh, obviously, we're speaking figuratively, but it's the same concept. That's what these mountains are. So we change the atmosphere, don't we? Because the Holy Spirit is in us. We're changing it wherever we go. Sometimes we do it just by being there. Uh, his Spirit interacts with the spirits of others. Uh, more often we add to that by using the many gifts he's given to us. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And these are both spiritual gifts and natural gifts. And we use these to help other people. And, and, and what we're looking for is to help bring God's solutions to the world's problems. Um, or if we're not doing that, we're just going about our work, the, the work that God's given to us as good witnesses to others. And... Um, you know, being examples of, of, of excellence, which is a gift from God itself. So what we're doing is representing him to the world. Now, I do want to look at this a little more closely. What does this have to do with intentionality? How do we go about climbing the mountains of influence and getting promoted as we move from glory to glory and changing the atmosphere at each new level? It sounds like very heady stuff, but I hope you're beginning to get a feeling that, see, maybe I'm already doing this. Um, and, and, and it gets back again to first, there's several steps, but first is using the gifts that God has given us. So look at your gifts. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us in Romans 12:6. No man should appear before the Lord empty handed. Each of you must bring a gift in proportion to the way the Lord your God has blessed you in Deuteronomy. And then recall 1 Peter 4:10. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. So there's several gift lists we can look at. The first one is the five-fold leadership gifts of Ephesians 4.11. Uh, it's apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist, plus service and administration which from 1 Corinthians. Uh, the nine gifts of, uh, of the Holy Spirit from 1 Corinthians 12.7-11, through 11, which is word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, distinguishing between spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues, and the seven motivational gifts of Romans 12, 6 through 8, which are prophesying, serving, teaching, encouraging, giving to others, leadership, and mercy. Some of those seem fairly prosaic, if that's the word. Some of them seem rather lofty. But the fact is, we all have these gifts distributed abundantly among us, and we should be using these gifts for the kingdom. Look through the gifts sometimes when you know, go through the Bible. It's, they're easy to find the gifts uh, there and, and see which ones you have. None, obviously, none of us has all of them, but all of us has more than one. In addition, as I mentioned, there are natural gifts. Uh, maybe you're gifted at cooking, carpentry, or fixing things. Maybe you're a good writer, good athlete, good driver, musician, an artist. Maybe you're really good at math or really good at clerical work. You know, the list goes on. But the point is, use these gifts and talents to display the excellence of Christ, bringing beauty, joy, and, and the satisfaction, as well as the testimony of a job well done into the marketplace. A job well done is testimony. Well, if you're not sure what your gifts are, how do you find out? What am I good at? Um, what am I passionate about? What do others say I'm gifted at? Um, you, you can, uh, you know, what do, I, what do I find myself drawn to doing whenever I have some spare time? What do I find myself making time to do? Because I just have to do it. I'm passionate about it. What do other people say about my gifts? Have, have any of you ever received prophetic words uh, about what your gifts are? Did those words help you see yourself as God sees you? Uh, whether you're practicing the way he sees you now or whether this is a picture of how he sees you in the future that you can line up with and position yourself to go for. The um, point of all this is, um, is, is, is to think about these gifts and understand or, or think about how you may be using them or should be using them to impact the world. And the point of all of it, too, is you're not empty-handed, whether you think you are or not. Okay, now we're talking about what does it look like 
the second point in terms of what do you do, think of it like climbing an actual mountain. You press on at a pace that won't wear you out. You don't push other people out of your way. You help those who are faltering but want to succeed. In other words, be a good example. Be a servant. Create a healthy atmosphere. If there's a problem nobody can solve, ask the Holy Spirit to give you the solution, or at least a, a key to what the solution is. Every once in a while you'll reach a plateau. It's a place where you can rest, where you can think about the things you've learned. Um, and, uh, and also, of course, as you're resting, which actually is a position of strength, gathering strength for the next, for the next level. And there's another thing we rarely think about, and that is you're going to meet people coming down. This doesn't mean they're going the wrong direction. Maybe they've retired. Maybe they don't need to be at the top of their mountain anymore. Maybe it, time has come for someone to take their place. But you can learn from them. So be sure and ask them to tell you about their experiences, uh, what to watch out for, tips for success, and so on. And then don't forget to do the same for others as, as you are, uh, reach a point where it's time for you to come back down as well. A third point, think of the process of growing and gaining experience. Uh, some good and maybe not, some not so good experiences. If you've been a bad place, in a bad place and, and come through the trial, then you're in a better position to help others who are going through the same thing, right? God will have blessed you in that way in the midst of it, as Melissa so eloquently talked to us about a couple weeks ago. It's the same whether you're experiencing good and pleasurable or fulfilling experience. It just makes it easier for you to lead people into that, that same kind of experience, maybe like a mentor or something. And when you're going through something, maybe it was like you were in a maze, couldn't see your way out. But now, you're a little higher on the mountain. You can look down and see the solution to that maze. And that may allow you to help somebody else who's in the maze figure it out. So, um, and when you do that, these people are going to see you as a testimony to what God has done in your life that got you through it. So, their faith is built. Um, the result of all that is you have credibility now, don't you? You've got credibility with people on your same level. Uh, you've earned the respect of those who are above you who maybe are looking for somebody to promote. Uh, you're proven, you're trustworthy, you have the character to respect and protect and grow that which is entrusted to you. I won't get into the parable of the talents. But you're a good steward and you're a good leader. So pretty soon you're in line for another promotion up the mountain. Fourth idea, what if you hit a stumbling block? Maybe it's somebody who's jealous. Maybe it's somebody with a negative attitude about everything, doesn't care about having any influence, doesn't want anybody else to have any either. Uh, what if there's just a hopeless, oppressive atmosphere where you are? What do you, what do, you do? Well, invoke, uh, come at it with it from the opposite spirit. If you, you've, you know, you've got the light. And in the, if there's darkness, it can't, it can't stand in the presence of light. If there's fear, offer love. If there's doubt, declare what you know to be true. If there's anxiety, speak peace. If there's sorrow, find some joy, and so on. Fifth idea. You are planting seeds. You may never know how much what you do impacts others, who then impact still others, everywhere on the mountains, and so on, in this generation and the next. So, you know, was there somebody who influenced the, 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 uh, the young Billy Graham? Maybe you'll influence the next one. The sixth idea, new slide, the enemy would like us to compare ourselves with each other, but don't do it. Just do your best and follow your heart. James 4, 7, and 10 says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And I love that lightning is so fast. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. So that's where your strength lies. Let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Because that's where they came from. Next slide, the seventh idea. Be ready with a word of encouragement for those around you. For the Lord has given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. 
A person finds joy in giving an apt reply. And how good is a timely word? Do you know how a word in season can change the atmosphere? How many of you have seen this video on YouTube called The Power of Words? Uh, I'll describe it. It's, it's this one where the blind man is sitting in the town square and he's got this cardboard sign that says, I'm blind, please help. He's not getting very much money in his little tin cup. Till a woman walks by, picks up the sign, turns it over and writes something else on the back of it. And suddenly the man is getting lots of money. And we, we pan out and the sign now says, it's a beautiful day and I can't see it. Big difference, right? Here's one that's a little closer to home. This is a little pocket park near our house. Why does the sign have to say when the park is closed? Let's try it a different way. All right. Isn't that a little more inviting and full of life? You know, never mind the balloons. They're not in the city budget. But uh, the point is, change your words, change your world. It's simple. Okay, let's go to the next one. You know, maybe God's will for you or his plan for you or your destiny you know, is to stay in the foothills and, and make as much difference there as you can. There's nothing wrong with that. If that's what the Lord is having you do and the Holy Spirit is clearly telling you about that. But, but, but even there, look back on your life and, and see how many times you've already been promoted, so to speak. Once you were a, a son or a daughter, now you're a father or a mother. You were a beginner, now you've got experience. You're part of some organization somewhere, probably more than one, and you're changing its atmosphere. So, see, you're climbing the mountains, right? Already, you're making a difference. And if there's a desire for even more greatness in you, then go for it. Jesus influenced the seven mountains not by being the CEO or winning an Oscar, but by listening and obeying the Father. His obedience to the call in his life has enriched all who receive him, no doubt about that. So remember, we were born to be blessed and to be a blessing. Uh, Eric Liddell, the famous runner of Chariots of Fire fame, said, When I run, I feel God's pleasure. So feel good about it and keep it up. Thank you for watching The Seven Mountains of Influence and How You Influence Them. Look for more sermons and teaching by Walt Pilcher on YouTube and LinkedIn. Walt's book, The Fivefold Effect, Unlocking Power Leadership for Amazing Results in Your Organization, is available on Amazon.com. Engagingly written and with a foreword by Dr. Mark Berkler, The Fivefold Effect shows you how to use the God-given fivefold ministry gifts of Ephesians 4.11 to supercharge productivity in any marketplace organization. Go to Amazon.com and order a copy or download as an ebook today.